want to welcome everybody joining us today at all of our locations for a very special service. It's actually one of my favorite services of the entire year when we stop and we just remember the amazing love of Jesus Christ. We just sang that song, my wealth is in the cross. I've counted up the cost and all that I thought was gain is loss. All my wealth is in the cross. What does that really mean? All my wealth is in the cross. Does it mean it's in this piece of wood? Is it, wood can't cost very much. It's just a few planks of wood nailed together. Is, is, is that where my, my wealth is in this, this piece of wood? Or does it mean something different than that? Because the cross in the day of Jesus, it was a symbol of, of suffering and shame and, and disgrace. I mean, like the most vilest of people were crucified on the cross. Nobody was singing about the cross, you know, back in Jesus' day, nobody was cherishing the old rugged cross. Nobody was wearing a little symbol of the cross around their neck back in Jesus' day, no. It was, a, it was an instrument of death and, and destruction. It would be like a modern day version of the electric chair. Nobody's singing songs about the electric chair, right? Nobody's got an electric chair around their neck, right? No, it'd be crazy. Yet one day changed everything. One day over 2,000 years ago, the way the world thinks about the cross, the way we see the cross, and what the cross of Jesus Christ means changed with that one event. And what's amazing to me is what happened on the cross and all that represents is just as powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago. As the day it took place, just as powerful to set the captive free, just as powerful to open up blinded eyes, just as powerful to bring hope to the hopeless, that same power is in the message of the cross today. I have counted up the cost and all, all of my wealth is in the cross. You may not realize it, but those words actually come from scripture. And there's been a scripture on my heart as I've been praying about this time together and celebrating the cross. It comes out of what the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter three, uh, verses seven, eight, and nine. Let me read this for us today. He says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider them a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. He goes on to say, I consider them all garbage. All the things I thought were so important, I consider them all as garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from obeying the law or keeping the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Now it's important to note right before this scripture, if you have your Bibles open, you can look at it, but right before this scripture, Paul is listing out all his accomplishments, all his successes, everything that he saw in his life as being so great. I mean, his prestige and his, and his power and his position. He calls himself in verse five, the Hebrew of Hebrews, which means if there's any Jew, Jew of the Jews, I'm like the best Jew going on is what he was saying. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, which is kind of like a prestigious tribe, you know? He says, I'm a Pharisee, which means uh, uh, he was from the most orthodox group that, that kept all the laws. I mean, like 600 and some laws. He obeyed all those laws. He knew all of scripture. He said, listen, I, I, I count all of that. All of, my, all of my, I was respected. I had power. I had influence. He says, all of it is rubbish that I may gain Christ. All of it is garbage compared to what Jesus Christ has done for me. That word garbage in the original language actually means a dung, animal, what comes out the backside of an animal. That's what it means. Got the picture? He says, all the things that I thought were so important and so worthy of my attention and my time and my pursuit, all of it, is nothing but dung, but, but I wouldn't even want to touch it. Wouldn't even want to get near it. I don't want to focus on that. Paul's saying, I'm not, I'm not going to hold on to these things. I'm not going to trust in those things. I'm not going to find my identity in those things. 
I wonder what it is that we find our identity in. I wonder what it is that we trust in, what we, what we look to. I mean, some of these trophies of life that we, that we get from accomplishments or successes that we proudly display in our lives. Things that we've done that we're proud of and excited about, and man, we, they, we find our identity in, in that. Could be like a diploma, names, accomplishments that we, hey, I succeeded in this area. I, I'm, I, this, is, this is who I am. I've got it hanging on my wall. I want you to see who I am and what I've done and what I've accomplished. I, I've got this on my desk. It tells you who I am. So just in case I forget, I can look down. I'm the CEO. I'm a big guy in charge. For many people, it's, it's money, it's success. We find our identity and our security in the things of this world that try so hard to satisfy, but they can't really satisfy. These things, we, we, we go from accomplishment to accomplishment, from achievement to achievement, and somehow trying to impress ourselves or impress people around us. But I think down deep, we're looking for a little bit of satisfaction, a little bit of contentment. But in the words of the theologian Mick Jagger, I can't get no satisfaction. I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried. Too many people are trying and trying and trying and trying and trying to find their satisfaction and their contentment in the things of this world, but this is never gonna satisfy. It might feel good for a moment, but it doesn't satisfy that, that craving that is in our soul that has been put there by God and for God. And the only way we find that fulfillment is in right relationship with God. And the only way that we have right relationship with God is through the cross. This, this is where we find it. We find it in Jesus. And the cross represents that relationship that we have and can have with God today through Jesus. Paul says, I count it all as loss. I consider it a loss. That word count or consider is actually an accounting term and it was, means to evaluate or to assess. And what he's saying in this passage is I've been evaluating my life. I've been reassessing the focus of my life. My identity has been focused on the wrong things and I've had to turn and reassess my life. Let me tell you, it is a good thing to, to stop and reassess your life. It's important along your journey to reevaluate your priorities and what you're running after and what you're working for and what, you're, where, what your pursuit is. Is it in the things that are temporary or is it in the things that are eternal? Is it in the things that are gonna pass or in something that will last forever? Now, let me just say this. There's nothing wrong with accomplishments. There's nothing wrong with um, success because I could read some passages today that talk about, you know, in Colossians, whatever you do, do it as under the Lord, do it with everything you've got. And if you do something with everything you've got, you're gonna accomplish something, right? Jesus said in John that it's good that you are fruitful with your life. It even actually pleases God when you're fruitful, right? And you produce. So it's not about not being productive or successful. Paul's just saying, don't be so consumed with this. Don't be so focused on this that you miss what life is all about. It's, it's all about perspective and it's all about your your focus and if you get the right focus the focus changes everything if you get the right perspective it'll change your path through the rest of your life the writer of hebrews chapter 12 says since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us throw off everything that hinders and every sin that might easily entangle us and let us run the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on jesus See, the only way that you can run the race that's marked out for you is you've got to make sure your focus is right. You've got to be focused on Jesus. You've got to be focused on what who he is and what he's done for you. And that puts everything else in perspective. See, when your focus is on the cross, when your focus is on the cross, then it brings all of life into the right perspective. You begin to look at your successes even in the right perspective. Your failures in the right perspective. This cross, when you get this cross and your focus is on the cross, everything else in life begins to make a little more sense. First of all, when it comes to your successes, you understand that the only reason you have any success is because of the grace of God. The only reason you have breath today is because of the grace of God. That anything good is coming from God above, the Bible tells us. The Bible even says your ability to think about things and be creative and work and even produce wealth, guess where that comes from? It all comes from God. 
And so when you understand life and you are focused through the cross, even those things begin to make success, I mean, begin to make sense. And even your, your sins and your failures begin to take the, on the right focus. You don't get consumed with your mistakes and your sin. You see them in light of the grace of God, that he's taking care of all of the sin and all of the past and all those mistakes because your focus is on the cross, not on what you've done or didn't do. Your focus is on the cross. The cross puts everything into right perspective. Even your identity, it's not wrapped in it in your past, it's not wrapped up into your successes, it's wrapped up in that you are a child of God because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So where is your focus today? What, what are you focused on? I think some of us are probably like what Paul used to be. We, we think that those things are gonna give us hope and satisfaction in life and so we're focused there, but some of us, we begin to change our focus a little bit. You know, when I turned 40, I had to start wearing glasses. Well, I needed to wear glasses when I was 40. I waited till I was about 43 to get them. I was resisting it. And uh, I recently switched over to contacts a few years ago. I, I, literally, uh, this is not too many people know this, one contact. I only need one contact. It's for one eye. Uh, so I can see for a distance. Uh, I, I don't need my contacts to see up close or to read. So many times I forget to put my contacts in because I don't need them in the morning when I'm reading the Bible. I don't need them in the morning when I'm checking something on the computer or when I'm getting ready around the house. I don't need them until I, I actually get in the car and have to go somewhere, then I need them, okay? I, I, don't need, I don't need it until I have to see where I'm going. Some of you don't know where you're going because you don't have your contacts in. You don't know what your future is supposed to look like because you're just, when I'm focused in the morning on just what's around me, I don't need my contact or my glasses. But when I get in that car and start to drive somewhere, I need to see where I'm going. You need to put the right contact in, the right lens through the cross so you find the future that God has for you and the purpose and the place that God wants you to go. Focus on the cross. You know, this whole passage, Paul is talking about profit and loss. Did you pick up on that? I used to consider this a profit or a gain. I now consider this a loss. And if you're a, a business person, you, you know what P&Ls are and profit and loss and spreadsheets and all that, you get that. You, and even if you're not a business person, you can understand that you want your profits to exceed your losses or you're in trouble. And what he's saying here is, you, I've been investing in the wrong things. If there's something that you're investing in and it is producing loss in your life, you gotta get rid of it. Don't, don't keep investing in those things that produce loss. Sell it, get rid of it, move on, right? Invest in something that's gonna produce gain. It would be ridiculous to keep investing in the things that don't satisfy, that don't produce life in you and begin instead to invest in the thing that brings life and brings gain. Jesus said in Mark chapter eight, he said, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Again, there's gain and loss, gain and loss. He, he was saying that if you, if you gain everything that the world says is so valuable and so important and significant, but you lose your soul, you're in trouble because you're gonna live with your soul a whole lot longer than you're gonna live with that car or live with that job or live with that success or live with that accomplishment. Your soul is gonna carry with you into eternity. And Jesus says, don't, don't focus on the wrong things. Keep your focus right, focus your life, center your life on the cross. And when this, when this is centered right, everything else in your life will begin to make sense. Paul goes on in verse 10 of Philippians, he says, I wanna know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I read that again this week and I went, I wanna know Christ. Wait a minute, Paul, don't you know Christ? I mean, you're saying, I wanna know Christ, but you already met him on the road to Damascus that day when the risen Lord came to you and revealed himself to you. You already know him because you've, you have a, you've been walking with him and you've been in relationship with him and you've been preaching the good, why, why would you say, I wanna know Christ? What he's saying there is, I wanna know him, I wanna know him more. I wanna know him more deeply than I've ever known him before. I wanna experience him, that word know, implies an intimacy that is so deep and so connected. It's not, it's not a, a casual relationship. It's not 
um, tangential. It's not just something that's on the side. It is central. And he's saying, I want to know him that way. And by the way, this is, this is what's different about Christianity and all other world religions. They're all about rules. We're all about this relationship that we get to have with Jesus Christ. And this verse also reminds me of a, of a very frightening truth that you can know about Jesus, but not really know him. That's not what Paul's talking about right here, but, but you can know about Jesus and not really know him. How many of you, show of hands, all of our locations, you came to faith uh, a little bit later in life. You know, you weren't a kid when you finally came to faith. Hold your hands up high. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I bet that you knew about Jesus before you ever personally came to know Jesus. I'm betting you heard about Jesus, you sang songs about, you might even pray to Jesus before you actually came into this born again relationship with Jesus. But the way you know him now is so different than the way you knew about him then. Don't just know, don't, don't just settle with for knowing about God or knowing about Jesus, know him in a personal way. You, you may know a lot about a lot of people. You may know about Tom Hanks, or you may know, think you know Oprah, or think you know the Kardashians because you follow them on Twitter, or think you know Ricky Flower because you watch them play golf. You may think, but you don't know them probably. You, you know about them. I wanna make sure you know that you can know this Jesus, that this isn't just some religious activity we're about today. This is about an intimate friendship and love relationship with the God who created you. But Paul already knew him personally. And yet he says here, I want to know Christ. He even goes on to say, I want to share in his sufferings. I, 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 I want to identify him even within his death. I want to know every part of, of him. I mean, when I read this, it makes me want to know Jesus more. When I'm around people that love Jesus a whole lot, it makes me want to love Jesus more. When I'm around somebody who has great faith, it makes me have more faith. When I'm around somebody who loves ice cream, it makes me want to eat ice cream, okay? It's just, it matters who you hang with, I'm just telling you. And so when you read after Paul, when you hang after people, hang with people that love the cross of Jesus Christ, they love Jesus with all their heart, it'll get on you, it'll get in you, and it will build a desire within you to fall more in love with Jesus. And by the way, it's not complicated. This whole, I want, how do I know Christ more? He said, I want to know Christ. How do you know? It's not complicated. Many of your relationships are complicated. You've got complicated relationships. I know you ask people, what, are you still dating that? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> or you ask something about their family, like, oh, it's complicated. <sighs> you know, you all got complicated relationships. Hey, this is not a complicated relationship. Your relationship with Jesus is not complicated. If you... <laughs> If you pursue him with your heart, if you turn your life over to him, and then every day, what you're doing today, man, you are spending time with Jesus right here. When you open up the word, you're spending time with Jesus. When you decide to put on praise and worship music instead of the honky talk music, you are, you are spending time with Jesus. And when you spend time with somebody, it's gonna deepen that relationship. So just focus on Jesus. Focus on what he's done. Invest in this relationship. This focus will change your future. The focus on the cross will change your future because it will change the rest of your life. And my prayer that this week as we kick off what is Holy Week is that our focus would be on Jesus. And today on the cross and his suffering and on his love for us. The Bible tells us that God demonstrated his love for us that and while we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. He didn't wait till we got good enough. He didn't wait till we cleaned ourselves up and got our act together. It was while we were still sinners. That's when Christ died for us, which tells me that each one of us, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are today, you can come to Jesus. You can, you can come to God through Jesus Christ. You can have this relationship. It doesn't matter what you've done. I'm gonna say it again. It doesn't matter where you've been last night. It doesn't matter. Today is the day that you can have this right relationship with God. And no matter if maybe your relationship isn't where it needs to be, today's the day it can get right. And as we prepare our hearts for this very sacred week, I want us to start by sharing communion together. I want us to take time to remember what Jesus did for us. Paul writes in Corinthians that when we share in the Lord's Supper together, we're supposed to stop and reflect on the price that he paid for us. And so I'm gonna ask all the ushers at our campuses to come. We're gonna take communion together as a church. And we're gonna take time to just quietly reflect in our hearts this amazing love and this amazing invitation. And I wanna ask you to do this too, that while you're thinking, you're holding the cup 
in your hand and the, and the, and the little cracker representing the, the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. And we're gonna wait to take communion together here at all of our campuses in just a moment. But I want you to reflect on where's your focus? Is your focus on the things of this world that will not satisfy or is your focus on the cross of Jesus Christ? Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you that you demonstrated your love. You made sure we knew loud and clear of your great love for us. And today as we begin Holy Week, this week where we pause and remember the death and crucifixion of Jesus Christ and then we celebrate the resurrection over hell and the grave, Father, we stop and we thank you because we know it's all because of love. Jesus, it's all because of your love for us that you came and gave yourself for us. And we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. table is an opportunity for us to refocus. As Pastor Todd had already mentioned, to examine our lives and to realize that Christ is the only one who can satisfy. Jesus makes this declaration in the Gospel of John. He says, I'm the bread of life. And if you come to me, you will never go hungry. And if you drink of my cup, you will never be thirsty. So communion, it refocuses us and it reminds us that only Christ can satisfy. Some simple symbols that we hold in our hands today, but resemble two important things about that night with his disciples as he forecast his broken body, his body that was beaten so that humanity could be made whole and experience the forgiveness of sins. Let's eat the bread together. At that same meal, he lifted up a cup of drink and he said, this cup represents a new covenant of my blood that'll be shed once and for all. This blood symbolic of the sacrifice that was gonna be made once and final through the death of Christ, that in his death, we might experience life that is truly life, but also a cup that represents a satisfaction that only Christ 
can bring to our hearts and to our lives. Let's drink the cup together. I want to invite you to stand as we pray over these elements today with a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving in our heart because of the satisfaction and the life that we experience in Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for your son Jesus, his life that was given that we might experience true life. Thank you for that broken body. Thank you for that blood that was shed that we can experience wholeness and forgiveness. And God, we declare today that all of our satisfaction, all of our wealth, all of our identity is found in the cross alone. Our wealth today in the cross of Jesus Christ. Come on, church. We're going to sing it today. We're going to declare it in our hearts. Our wealth is found in the cross. Come on. The cross, there's nothing more I want than just to know. invite you to grab a seat. This is a special time in our service today as we prepare to respond to the message that we just heard. When you came in, you received a black card and a pencil. If you didn't get one of these on your way in, our ushers are prepared to make sure that you receive one. You can just raise your hand and they'll be quick to get you your card and your pencil. But before you begin to write anything on these cards, I just want to speak a little bit about what this cross represents for us you know we've been talking about it now for quite some time that this cross equals love and we know as pastor todd has already shared that there's a time in history when the cross was looked upon as a symbol of death and hatred but as followers of christ this cross means life and love for us. The greatest display of love was demonstrated on this cross for us. Jesus, after being betrayed, was taken. and He was beaten. They say that the whip that Jesus was beaten with had sharp objects tied on the end of it like glass and bones of animals. And as Jesus was chained to a pole. They began to whip and beat his body and torture him. See, the Romans, they had perfected this crucifixion. They wanted to prolong the agony and the death of the individual who would face its demise. And after they would beat him, Jesus would pick up his crossbar and he would begin to make his way outside of the city up to the hill of Golgotha and it would be on that hill that Jesus would be thrown upon this cross and they would stretch out his hands I can't help but think that the hand of Christ that that hand that Mary once held of that little baby boy was the hand that was going to be stretched out on this cross. The hand that was going to be pierced for our sins. Scholars believe that maybe the Romans at this time, they would use a rope to tie onto the other arm of Jesus and to extend it across the arm bar, the crossbar, pulling it out of socket. The other hand of Jesus. I think about that image of Peter on the sea of 
He's looking at Jesus, but all of a sudden the winds and the waves, they distract him and he takes his eyes off of Jesus, but Jesus reaches out his hand to Peter. That same hand that would be pierced with a nail. Then they took his feet, the same feet that walked that Galilean seashore that delivered a message that was like no other message. A message about a kingdom. See, his followers, they they wanted an empire. They, they, They wanted some different kind of rule or reign, but Jesus, he walked those hills with a different message. A message of love, a message of forgiveness, a message of relationship, not a message of religion or tradition. And scriptures say that Jesus there on this cross paid the ultimate price for our lives. This cross, it equals love. This cross reminds us of the forgiveness that we can experience in Christ. And this cross means that we could have relationship with God. See, Jesus, he had to make his way through the cross so that we could get to God. Jesus declared that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one should come to the Father except through me. He had to face the cross so that we could experience a relationship like no other relationship. And so on that card that you were given when you came in, there's a couple different things that you can write on these cards today. Maybe there's a sin in your life that has been keeping you held captive. You cannot seem to overcome that sin and experience the freedom that Christ has for you. I want to encourage you to write that sin on this card. And when you come and you symbolically nail this card to the cross today, that it would be a day of freedom for you, trusting that the power of Christ would allow you to experience that freedom. Or maybe today it's not a confession on your card, but it's a celebration. It's a something that you are thankful for. Maybe God moved in your heart and life this year like never before, and you just want to express your immense gratitude to God. You can write that on that card today and come and say, Jesus, I'm thankful for the work that you're doing in my heart and in your my life. Or maybe it's not a sin and it's not something that's to be celebrated. Maybe there's just a burden that you are carrying in your life. Jesus said, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You could write that burden on the card. Or maybe you're a parent in this place, and there's a child who's not walking with the Lord. You want to write their name on that card and say, God, I, again, I just I surrender my child to you. Or maybe it's a spouse that is away from the Lord, or a coworker, or a friend, and someone that you want to symbolically surrender today in faith to the cross. Or just maybe today. This is really new for you. And you don't have a relationship with God yet. Today is your day. And you can write your very own name on this card and surrender your life to Jesus Christ in relationship with him. I want to pray for you as you begin to write on these cards. And then you're going to step out of your seats. There's arrows on the floor. The two side wings are for exits. And you leisurely could take your time and come and nail these things to the cross today. Let me pray for us. Father, we know that this moment in our service is not simply to stir our emotions, but to be reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, that he was pierced for our forgiveness, that he paid the penalty of our sin and our shame and our guilt so that we could have right relationship with you. God, for every issue that is nailed to this cross today, I pray that it would serve as a milestone in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.